5. Year 100 of the Dawn Compassion, Obsession I wish you were my brother, who nursed at my mother's breast. Then, if I met you outdoors, I would lead you, bring you to my mother's house. I would give you spiced wine to drink and fresh juice from pomegranates. Song of Songs I have been sitting here all day thinking about men, again. Why is it that I want to give to them so much? I wish I could stop, you know, turn off the compassion button. I know that my Adam loves me, of course he does, and he did even more so in the garden before sin came between us. Now he is toiling on the earth under our curse, or his specific curse, which women will also take on at some point. How can we not? We will relish the idea of having our own money and being able to make our own decisions. We will love to have the power to make something or do something in addition to childbearing and serving our husbands. Not all women want to do something outside the home. Some will like to work at home or creatively teach their own children. Years from now, some women will be able to live alone and be able to support themselves and even others. They will have choices. These women will be very lucky indeed. Many women, in positions with affluence and influence, will offer amazing assets in the workplace because of their innate ability to create a more holistic environment which benefits everyone. Yes, I believe women were created to achieve incredible accomplishments with our lives, in our vocations, isn't that what the godly woman is all about? Working with wool and flax? Buying a vineyard and planting it? When I was in the garden, I enjoyed organizing the animals into groups, and we had discussions, marvelous discussions, about appreciating the lavish, burgeoning vegetation in the garden distinctively made for the requirements and mannerisms innate to each animal. They were so smart. They are so smart, those animals. I only wish they could talk now, but of course they don't. Each animal was created perfectly in the garden, each distinctly unique. The giraffe, one of my favorites, would dialogue with me about her long neck and how it felt to stretch her head into the lofty leaves. The other animals and I would chuckle at the giraffe's jokes about her licking the sky with her long tongue and how it tasted like blueberry. People will, later on, spend years trying to teach animals to talk. There will be the monkey that the scientists will teach how to speak in human language. After they will take about 13 years to teach the monkey how to talk, the monkey will finally open his mouth to talk. Everyone will stand around his cage, anticipating some great monkey philosophy that might fill them with satisfaction and animal wisdom. But the only thing the monkey will say is, Let me out. Smart monkey. He did not want to live outside of the garden either. It was perfect there for the animals. They could communicate their needs to Adam and me. They had plenty of food. I guess they were all vegetarians. It's hard to remember now, but I certainly don't recall anything at all like the food chain I see now. Geez, I guess the fall hurt the animals too. After the fall, we started to eat them, but I would like to write about that another day. My goodness, there's a lot I want to say. So back to where I was. Men, ha. Huh. No wonder the animal thing came up so quickly, as I was about to write about men. Get it? Men, animals, men, animals. Now, men, don't get offended. I'm just making fun of the human race that came from the seed of Adam, planted in my garden of fruitfulness. Men and women are different, and there's just no way around it. My sons, of course, were perfect. Well, that is, until one of them killed the other. Oh my, things get complicated as we struggle to survive outside of Eden. I can't stop thinking about my daughters in regards to men, how they can't stop helping them either. 
I get so frustrated. Just the other day, one of my distant daughters met a man, probably one of my other children grown up, but I have so many now, it's hard to recognize them as my babies. I mean, think about it. How did I populate the earth? Get out of town. Despite my age, I still look amazing, if I do say so myself, and Botox has not even been invented yet. It must be due to the organic farming, before pesticides were invented, and the fresh air uninhibited by carbon emissions. Anyway, I know how it is. My daughter has her own Adam, but he gets a little boring in the sack after scores of years, and she meets this man who is so adorable. Of course, nothing happened. I mean, it wouldn't. I've taught my daughters to be honorable women. But there was the basic flirtation between a man and a woman, and after 30 minutes, she's trying to think of ways to help him. She begins to say, I can do that for him. Oh, pick me. I can help you get that accomplished. Jeez, daughter, call it off already, before it becomes something more than it should be. But then they part ways with words of, Oh, so sweet to meet you, that sort of thing. I hope to pass by this way again and see you the next time I water my camels. Then at night, she's lying in bed thinking of him. Not in a sexual way, although I'm sure she's not above that, no one is, but in a loving, compassionate, womanly, wifely, sisterly, nurturing kind of way. Oh, that sweet man, she's thinking, in a motherly fashion. What he needs is my loving, strong arms under his head at night. If I could love him, hold him, how he would flourish. Hold on, woman. Have another baby if you want to hold someone so much. Or go visit an elderly person and give them a hug. So much energy going out from women to random men that, in the end, they don't even care about. What is that about? Is it a God thing? Like, he made women to help, and then we just can't help but pour out this helping, compassionate side? I'm not sure, but I know how it is with my daughter. With all of my daughters. With me, even. It's so cool when I'm in that frame of mind that I actually feel love leaping from me, surrounding that person, and he is being healed or strengthened or restored. But then... Time's a-wasting, girlfriend. If he's not your Adam, leave him alone. I'm wondering if there's a way to shut it off, or if there's a way to channel it. I mean, there is so much love. It can't all possibly go to Adam and my children. I have so much to give. Maybe it's a God thing, put into me as a woman, that I actually flourish as I nourish and nurture. Maybe the Spirit of God is caring about this person and desires me, as a vessel, to pour pure love and kindness. Not sex or sensuality, but pure, unconditional love over him and the other men in my life. Like lavishing love on a brother. Oh, I wish you were my brother so I could bring you into the home of a good mother. As a paraphrase of the Song of Songs might go. I hope I can make logic of this. I hope I'm making sense to you. It's a wonderful, warm, gushy place when I feel that way, and it can be totally pure. Maybe it's solely a spiritual thing. As I mentioned previously, if I go find this man and start helping him physically, since he's not my Adam, I'm just wasting my energy. My time is too precious for this unless he's my boss or something, and I'm paid to help him. But I don't have a boss here in the year 100. I do think the nurturing, empathetic heart of a woman is so invaluable. What if we could bottle it and use it only for those who will appreciate our balmy oil? Too much of it is wasted on bad boys who will never, never, and I repeat, never, return the favor. Don't waste your oils, daughters. Don't share your spices with the wrong man. He will take what he needs, and you will be left stripped and bare. More likely, 
The bad boys were not nurtured correctly, so they don't know how to treat a woman either. A husbandman tends the garden. If you are tending to his needs, but he is not tending to yours, move on. Wait for your Adam. What if a man had a bad mother? Or what if his mother abandoned him? Am I, a woman, supposed to take that place? I'm not sure. It's also complicated. I mean, Adam had a perfect mother, father, God, and he's not perfect. No, not by any means. But I do love him. I'm not perfect either, obviously, and he loves me with all of his heart. There are times with Adam that it's like heaven on earth, and it reminds me of making love in the garden before the fall and how incredibly beautiful those experiences were. Can you imagine perfect sex with pure love and no barriers? Later, after the fall, sin came between us, you know. Then came bickering and fighting, with selfishness and all kinds of weird and strange thoughts and behaviors that we didn't have back in the garden. In my heart, I long to be with my true lover back in the garden again. I long to feel enraptured in sweet surrender as my Adam, my beautiful, amazing Adam, filled me again and again with his love. No one else was on my mind, or on his, for that matter. No pinup girls, no centerfolds for him. And for me, no kind, handsome cabana boys. Wow. To make love with your one and only soulmate on earth, without each other's upbringings or parents' habits or extended family's eccentricities coming into the picture. This is nirvana. This was my nirvana, until I took that fateful bite. Oh, woe is me. Whoa, whoa, whoa. So I slip into my sexy lingerie, I lie down next to Adam. I think about being back in the garden, where my body didn't even age, even though I still look amazing at a hundred. The garden, where perfection and complete oneness with Adam were mine over and over and over again. My compassion as a woman is a gift from God. My obsession is part of the fall. As long as we are on this earth, we are under the curse. Men will love to look at it as history, and many will claim their right to superiority as if they are superior. Men will be generally stronger physically and often use that strength to dominate women. Women will constantly be put down in inferior positions and will repeatedly strive their way into positions of power. Even women's liberation and equal rights are laws put into effect mostly by men, big daddy government. While equal rights and liberation should be an absolute truth, rather than something that is decided upon by governments or tribes, true freedom comes from within. If someone can give you your freedom or take it back again, you are not really free. Freedom comes from inside from knowing who you are in a world of chaos and conflicting, often changing public opinions. Freedom isn't freedom, unless you are as free in prison as you are in an open field, as free being a slave as you are being a master, and as free being in a subordinate position as one who is in authority. An arrogant man, maybe one of my grown grandsons, it had to be, who else is there, told me the only thing women are good for is to become mothers to train boys into men. I thought I might hit him at that moment, but perhaps it is not too far from the truth. As long as we live in a fallen world, men will maintain most superior positions, women will continue to have babies, and more often than not, women will raise them. The fact that some men will argue their superiority only shows that they are not innately superior. Superior people simply are superior. They do not have to state it, claim it, argue it, 
nor do they want to put anyone else down to get it. Over the centuries, men will make statements about the inferiority of women. Too often, organized religions will put down women and even use God as the one putting them down. Say what they will, a scared rabbit in control will still be that, a scared rabbit. A true superior is the servant of all. Some cultures will esteem women. Lucky are the women housed in these borders. I say, let the best person have the job best suited for him or her, regardless of gender. Women, however, will be generally the weaker sex. There's no way around it, at least for now. For instance, I ran a marathon recently. At a hundred? Yes, I told you, things are much different now. And yes, we have sports here. I love to run. So does Adam. So we created a dirt trail that we run on for relaxation. A few years ago, we made it into an event. I beat many of the men, but the strongest man still won the race. The strongest man will continually beat the strongest woman in a test of physical strength. This is how it will be as long as the world is how it is now. That is why men need to be compassionate. They ought to look out for the weaker vessel. Vessel, meaning body, because the weaker sex is only referring to physical strength. We know that women are powerhouses of emotional strength. Women must own their equality. Men and women are equal, but different. Obviously. Years from now, in the 21st century, many women will take birth control, decide on the number of children they want to have, if any, be educated, and hold positions of authority in governments, in business, in education, and in society. But many women of the world will still not have equal rights of any kind. A healthy government would have an equal amount of men and women. But like I said, it may never be fair in the course of history. It may never become totally herstory. But realizing my own equality as being designed by God is vital to making my own herstory. A woman in the future will be faced with many choices. How am I to live as a woman? Should I have a career? Be independent? Should I get married? Have children? Should I put my career first? My God of the garden made me to be free. I enslaved myself by my own choices, but since God created Adam and me in his own image, I believe I have an ultimate freedom that no one can take from me. If one of my daughters in the distant future has the freedom in her culture to say what she wants or do what she wants, I hope she seeks God in the garden of her soul and makes her decisions there. The more free she can be regarding her compassions versus her obsessions, the better off she will be. My motto is to strive to live above the curse, redeeming my time daily by making healthy decisions as a woman. Replace compassion versus obsession with passion on purpose to accomplish whatever is necessary at the time. Life in the garden was so simple. I was dressed with my unblemished skin. I flitted among the leaves in the coolness of the evening as the moonbeams lit up the staged garden laced with soft moss and wildflowers, not to mention the four-leaf clovers, every one of them. Sigh. We are stardust. We are golden. And we've got to get ourselves back to the garden. Joni Mitchell, Woodstock, 1989-1990